Thank you, David. Um, it's, uh, it's actually a little humbling to be here among some, so many great innovators. Um, I actually just manage operational stuff. I actually don't do any actual science myself. I was told that if it was going to be a really good talk, I should be talking about lots of data, have calculus, you know, uh, equations up here and such, but I'm going to disappoint you. I'm, I'm not going to have any of that. Oh, some of you are shaking your heads. Thank God. Thank God it's not going to be that. No, it, it's not going to be that at all. Um, I am from Washington, D.C., so this is more of a, a brief to tell you what's what all the wonderful, great things we're doing for you. Absolutely no data in here, and in the end, I just want you to believe me. So, uh, no, just, just, just kidding. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you through a little bit of history lesson on um, on bioweapons, uh, go back a little bit to the days of Russia and the Soviet Union. I see some younger folks here. This is probably well before you were born. Um, it's back in, in the days where we had this thing called the Cold War with Russia. Uh, where they didn't like us, we didn't like them, and uh, we were kind of at a secret war with each other, but we really weren't shooting at each other, and we were trying to do everything we could uh, us, we were saying we are defending against them and making sure that they wouldn't attack us in the night, and we all had lots of nuclear weapons uh, that we're still concerned about these days, and there's lots to talk about nuclear weapons. Uh, but the other thing that was going on, there was a large bioweapons program um, in, in Russia and the Soviet Union, um, and a huge infrastructure that we worried about, and, and we didn't learn about it until after the Soviet Union, which is Russia and all the countries that belong to it, until the Soviet Union collapsed and all these countries became uh, independent. The one thing we worried the most about at that time, which Senator Nunn and Luger were really concerned about, was when the Soviet Union collapsed, they were more worried about nuclear weapons uh, and the control over nuclear material, radiological material. A lot of the safety infrastructure collapsed. The Russians pulled back to Russia. They left a lot of these independent countries on their own. And oh, by the way, they left a lot of warheads, missiles, uh, half-finished uh, weapons, nuclear material. Nobody knew who had it, where it was going. There was no command and control over it. And uh, this is an example. If, you're, if you do something really good and bipartisan in Washington, D.C., you have both senators' names on some sort of legislation. So it's always good to see two names on a piece of legislation. So this is the Nunn Luger Act uh, that we, we fall under in, uh, in the former Soviet Union. And as you can see, it was to, to really initially focus on, um, on, on nuclear weapons, but then also we knew Russia had a large chemical weapons program, as did we, and we by treaty agreed on both sides to eliminate those weapons. Uh, and then after the fact, we found out there was a large bioweapons program and infrastructure. We were building massive facilities and uh, production facilities to put things like anthrax spores, which if you in, uh, inhale them, are pretty deadly within three to five days you know, of inhaling. Um, it could be fatal for, for people, and there's no point of return. As we saw from the postal attacks, people who inhaled it, it was pretty fatal to them. So, uh, so they set up this program, which is, is under DITRA. Uh, a lot of my colleagues uh, helped the Soviet Union. We went in. A lot of people in the day resisted this. Said, why are we paying money to go in and secure stuff, and even help the Russians secure material? Because you remember, Russia was having a hard time at this point. But we said, it's in the best interest of the world, not only our national security, that we get a handle on this. And then also by treaty, um, we agreed to help the Russians eliminate their chemical uh, stockpile as we agreed to eliminate ours. Uh, the irony is our program helped the Russians eliminate theirs that we agreed to before we've eliminated ours inside the United States. We're still working on eliminating ours. The Russians finished eliminating theirs almost two years ago now with our help in this, in this type of program. Uh, so there's a little irony there. Ours is mired in no surprise, a little uh, congressional uh, debate on who should be doing it, how much it should cost, and whose constituents should be doing the work and such. Um, but so our program under non then was asked 
uh, not only to prevent the proliferation of the biological materials and weapons components, but uh, to really look at facilitating detecting or reporting of what we call pathogens of security concern. And let's get a little bit into it. I'll explain a little bit of what that what that is. All right, sorry. <clears throat> I'm not used to holding a mic in front of my face. So. Um, and I get cues of talking really loud too sometimes. Uh, so, and, and other diseases that uh, could be used um, for early mechanism for disease outbreak. Uh, and we're really focused on protecting our, uh, our war fighters. Those are all guys in military uniform because as DOD, we're deployed around the world globally 24-7. Uh, a lot of st permanent strategic bases, but then as you know, we're in a number of armed conflicts and. We also uh, uh, participate in a large number of humanitarian assistance efforts. So not only protect our own forces, but also our allies, our partners around the world uh, to help protect them. And so really what this is saying is whether an outbreak is a terrorist event, an accidental from a laboratory, or if it's a natural disease outbreak, you know, we're to help our partners to be able to identify and report this so that we can all respond and, and uh, be safe. So from that, we've uh, then taken and translated it to our mission for our program. And so really, we're considered a non-proliferation program. So our, our charge is then to go in and help people secure and safeguard the material, biological material that they may have in their lab so that it can't be used for nefarious purposes. Um, and that people can't take that technology and then try to use it to bring harm to the, to the, the locals, the country, and to a region, or even to us national security-wise. Um, and you see the term changed from especially dangerous pathogens. And, and, uh, and like I said, really focus on whether it was a terrorist accident or a national outbreak. And so we work on a couple of things that I will go over on biosecurity principles how to make sure a facility is safe, uh, safeguarded to keep people from coming in and taking things that are not supposed to have, how we're operating safely so that if it's a dangerous pathogen you work in the laboratory, that there's not an accidental laboratory infection, or that uh, there aren't appropriate environmental controls in place so that it becomes an aerosol and gets out into the community. And then lastly is that one piece of making sure we can do detection reporting so we can find these things early so that we can respond really early. Uh, a good example of what happens when you don't respond early is the West Africa Ebola outbreak. We can deal with Ebola. We know preventive measures need to be in place to keep the number of infections down, but there was a number of things going against the community there. There wasn't early detection. There wasn't a good infrastructure of dealing with this and taking protective measures for keeping other exposures from happening. They actually thought, because um, they didn't do appropriate testing and didn't really believe it, they'd never seen a bowl in this area, they thought it was Lhasa fever. And that area gets Lhasa fever every year. It just happens like clockwork. And they thought it was just happening a little earlier than normal. So not uh, having good infrastructure in place doing the detection reporting, then it became a magnified event. And there was other factors involved in that. So with bio, this is really what we're worried about. Um, other weapons of mass destruction, nuclear um, weapons, there's really only a handful of state actors. These are countries that own nuclear weapons in the world. We know who they are, we know that they have them. We do worry about safeguarding somebody getting it, a terrorist group using nuclear material. But for the main part, we know in a lot of these places they are controlled safeguarding those countries and we're worried about those countries using it. Uh, chemical weapons, you need a large infrastructure that's very visible to make enough chemical weapons to, to bring harm on a large population. Biological is a little different. There's biological uh, agents, and I'll get into those types of agents, in a lot of communities around the world because some of these are part of natural outbreaks that people collect, they test, make sure they know what's wrong with a person or animal, we're also talking animals, because the number of bioweapons that are used are called zoonotic diseases, which means they 
they can both infect animals and humans. And most likely, in most of the cases, a lot of infectious diseases would actually make a jump from animal to human, including influenza. Influenza usually goes from bird to like swine and from swine to people. And that's how we figure influenza circulates in the world. So there's always that nexus between humans and animals. Uh, and so when you hear the term zoonotic, it just means can affect both animals and humans. So by that standpoint, even if you're not planning on a weapon or having a weapon, some of the stuff in your freezer could actually be used as a weapon. So the problem with bio is it's around the world. People collect it, people use it for good in hospitals, laboratories to do research, to develop vaccines, testing to safeguard and help people. But like anything else, you can use it for, for nefarious intent. So this really keeps in mind, folks, that you'll see why we are in the number of countries we are at and why we worry so much about bio. Some folks have dubbed bio um, as a poor man's nuclear weapon. It's a lot easier to obtain. It's a lot cheaper to mass produce. Still takes a little bit of expertise to do it in a way that can do mass harm and infection. So people haven't bridged that gap yet, but it's, it certainly doesn't cost and, and require the huge infrastructure uh, as nuclear weapons do. So some of you are very familiar with this and you have to adhere if you're working with these pathogens to the select agents rule, which is actually managed by uh, CDC uh, and USDA, as I said, because these, these um, agents, biological agents, both animal and uh, some of these are strictly human, but the majority, about 80% of these, are both animal and human zoonotic uh, disease. So back in then, this list actually came about in the 90s, so it is pre-9-11, uh, back in the 90s, during the Clinton administration, a number of folks were worried about bioterrorism. And so they came up with criteria um, and risks and uh, things that we were worried about. And they came up with this list based on that. Something that could be used to create mass harm to um, mass number of folks ended up in these, uh, in these various categories. And you can see the highest priority agents are those who are easily disseminated, spread about, and have high, really, death rates, um, is, is what that's saying. And so that's how the categories came about. This was thinking about, uh, essentially, bioterrorism in mind. So what does that mean today? That means if you work in a lab and you work with any of these, uh, your lab has to be registered to say that you're working with this. So you have to register with CDC, USDA, you have to tell them who in the lab is working with this as part of that registration. And then the FBI does a background check on those people. So I you know David's probably worked in a select agents lab. They're then called select agents labs. Um, it takes quite a bit to maintain the security, inventory, safety guard measures. And so there's actually not that many labs around that do this full time because the administrative piece of it costs quite a bit to make sure that you're following all these rules and guidelines. You've probably seen in the newspaper every once in a while, a researcher, you know, go to the gallows, you know, <laughs> go get, get uh, prosecuted for not handling or labeling or not appropriately uh, explaining their intent use of materials or trying to skirt around this rule. So it's pretty serious. Not every country in the world has a select agents rule. Um, so I'm adhere to, there's Australia group has a, has a list, uh, but not everybody has this type of legislation. Uh, some in the world think that we're in the United States too restrictive by our rules and measures, but we think it's, it's appropriate and it just requires good coordination between um, the health agencies, CDC, USDA, and the law enforcement agencies. So, the other category that's in here is uh, category C, which is emerging diseases. Uh, we are also concerned about those that just could pop up, like uh, SARS, uh, which some of those, some of us remember in the early 2000s, kind of made its rounds really rapidly around the world, came out of nowhere. It's something we hadn't seen before, and it had a high uh, mortality rate, death rate, and it spread by aerosol um, rather easily. Uh, 
we, we try to keep on the lookout for those and prepare laboratories because those are the type of things that can turn into a pandemic. So epidemic is local. Pandemic uh, then becomes a number of multiple countries. And when it hits that threshold, the World Health Organization declares it as a pandemic as infecting the whole region in, in a larger area, which then becomes a worldwide event um, that just starts going out of control depending on the age of uh, 1918 influenza comes to mind in most people's mind. And with influenza, we worry that this may happen in the future again. And as you know, that's probably one of the biggest concerns. But looking for new, new agents, being prepared for those that may cause a similar. Um, Outbreak is, is what we, we keep on the lookout and try to prepare labs uh, for doing this. So we do this with uh, our international partners. We're, so we are considered an international technical assistance program. So we go out in the world and help foreign countries to put in, as I mentioned, the biosecurity, biosafety measures, and their biosurveillance, which is detection and reporting measures um, for all those those agents I talked about, and then even considering some that may not be in that list that should be considered. So, as you can see, these are, these are the countries we currently work with. Uh, the other thing that we look for in working with a partner is in, in some of these areas, a number of those uh, diseases or agents you saw on the select agents list, they happen on a regular basis. They have natural outbreaks of these. So they have a high concentration of these agents in their laboratory. And, uh, and so we work on looking at, all right, if you're collecting all this, and some of you that are scientists in the room know you have a hard time letting go of something in your freezer. Uh, once you have it, you don't like to let it go, even if you don't think you'll ever need it again. It's just so near and dear to you. It becomes like a child. So researchers around the world are all very similar in this vein. I'm telling you, you guys have a have a common core belief here that once I have it, I should never let go of it. But at some point, it becomes hard to manage. It's, it's, almost, it's almost like a hoarder mentality, right? You see a hoarder's house, and all this stuff crammed in there, at some point you forget where it is, or it's not labeled, or they, they may be the only ones know. It's, it's on the bottom shelf from the left back. That's a sample we collected in 1976, and, and it, was a, it was a Ebola sample. You know, they may be the only one in the lab that knows that because it's not properly documented and such. Uh, and it's like, why do you have it? It's, it? At some point, it becomes a risk. What if we have to thaw that freezer or it accidentally becomes thawed and you have to move it and you're the only one that knows it and you're gone? And now it becomes a safety issue. So we go help people get rid of unnecessary collection. And it is just as hard like it is with a hoarder to convince them you need to downgrade. It really is. Um, so, so. That's a, one of the things we looked at. So a lot of these areas that you see highlighted, they have a number of, of, of these pathogens in their country that are just natural. And they actually see these outbreaks on small scales naturally. So we know they're there. The other thing, because we're a security program and we're worried about terrorists, uh, in a number of these areas, there's also uh, what they're deemed today, you'll see, especially in the government, we call them violent extremist organizations. They're like ISIS. Uh, Al-Qaeda is still working quite openly in, in Southeast Asia and uh, we want to make sure that in those areas where we both have these pathogens and those type of groups that, that we try to safeguard and protect and make sure the laboratories are secure so that those type of folks can't get access uh, to that material. So. We work with a lot of people to make this happen. So our office doesn't really, I don't have all scientists and experts in my office. We are in DC, so we're managers. We mainly manage things, and uh, hopefully we do it well, because we're using your tax dollars, so we try to be really good stewards about that. But we use, we use folks where the expertise is. Uh, we use other agency partners who have expertise, who have maybe relationships over in these foreign countries um, that work both on the, on the human, the public health side, the animal side, and you can see also law enforcement side. Um, we work both partner countries with their civilian uh, public health agencies, their animal health agencies, 
but also in some cases, in some countries you go, the military hospitals and the military does the primary health care in some of these countries out in the regions. And so they have these pathogens and collections as well. And so we work also with the foreign partners military. And our, uh, our own military has health labs um, spread out around the world that have these linkages and connections. So we work, work with them. Because we're an international program, uh, we work quite extensively with the international organizations. Um, there's one that is number of our Western allies. It's a global partnership against the spread of weapons and materials of mass destruction. Um, we also work closely with the World Health Organization. Every country in the world is signed up to meet international health regulations. Probably not heard this term, but we've all agreed as the world community that if we have an outbreak that impacts our borders, travel and trade in a region, that we will take every effort and care to report that as quickly as possible to WHO and our partners. So we all committed to doing that. Um, the International Organization for Animal Health, uh, it's actually called OIE, which is the French acronym. It's French Organisation, I'm not French, so well, Internationale, and whatever the French word is for them. So. <laughs> That's sad. I don't speak French, but uh, so OIE, if you see that, that means Animal Health Organization. Uh, UN Food and Agriculture Organization, you make sure there's a safe food supply, which includes animal and uh, wheat and, and, and plant crops. And then Interpol, which is kind of our equivalent to FBI, the Security International. Because we're a security organization, we want security to be working with the health labs in case there is a terrorist event detect it early and to take appropriate response and actions. So this, this little diagram explains just kind of where we work and the areas that we work and what we do. So in the middle, the little red dot, just think of that, it's either the biological material that's sitting in the lab, just sitting there just by itself, not doing anything. Or it could also represent the initial stage for an outbreak. So since we're trying to deter and stop stuff, we work in detection diagnostic um, area to be able to detect early to stop things as early as possible to get back to that early reporting. The earlier I can call 911, you know, the sooner police will get there and take action. That's kind of the way to think of it, even in the public health community. Uh, may not be able to stop a disease outbreak with the earlier detected and start the response efforts, you'll kind of keep down the number of people who get infected or exposed. And, um, and epidemiological investigation, so probably heard of this, or some of you familiar or very familiar with this. These are the folks who go out into the field once we've detected something, and I'll say, all right, you've been tested positive with Ebola. Where were you the last 48 hours? Where did you go? Where did you come from? Who did you have contact with? Can you give us their names or relationships? Uh, where did you meet them? Where are they going? And then they go out and they start do the contact tracing so that they can start taking care of those people, monitoring those people. Maybe if they have to, ask for quarantine so that they don't do further um, further uh, spread of the disease. So EPI investigation officers, which are at CDC, and we try to train as many as we can around the world, they're really critical. They're like your, your detectives, your public health detectives, who are really critical for figuring out what's going on and really limiting the outbreak. So these are a really important part of that detection reporting system. Um, and then reporting. There may be international implications. If it is a terrorist event, the other thing we worry about, if they did it here, do they have enough material wherewithal to do it somewhere else? So we need to know really quickly to prevent them from doing it again. Um, what we also work on on the left side, you heard me say earlier, the whole freezer issue, samples just pack right away, is consolidate those, eliminate those that don't need to be there, that have no public health use. And uh, make, if they do, make sure they are well secure. Um, 
some of the security field all his guards, guns, and gates. She makes sure those guards, those guns, you know, they'll protect things and gates to keep people from coming in is at the highest level. That's what a lot of folks in the security world. And then we help countries maybe think about putting in place their own select agent rule and how to manage these laboratories. Because we don't want to stifle the research and the good public health work that's going on. We don't want to stifle innovation. We don't want to stifle the ability to do and develop uh, therapeutics or vaccines against these diseases. If you put such a heavy security burden on folks and don't allow them to work with these things at all, then we're not going to do the innovation to prevent these things in the future. Or maybe develop the detect uh, detection techniques, get you earlier reporting to, to help prevent these things. Instead of a sample having to come from the field into the lab, which takes time, maybe like folks that are working here in the innovation center, develop a diagnostic kit that you can take out into the field in the middle of the jungles and test somebody right on the spot. You don't have to then transport a dangerous sample somewhere to be tested. And you can get a result quicker to maybe isolate those people quicker so there's not additional outbreaks. So, so we have to always balance that and we have to get our partners to balance that as well. It's always a debate, science versus security. We've seen it here in the United States. And it just means good communication, putting the right practices in place. It does add a little bit of burden, but you know that's, that's the price of maintaining security as well, but there's always a fine balance. Um, so now I'll talk a little bit more in depth of the actual areas that we, we work in. Um, and I will at one point talk about the networks themselves and our ideas about networks. So we're getting there, just a little patience. Uh, biosecurity efforts, like I said, one way to think about, about this is guards, guns, and gates. As you can see, there's, there's nice uh, fence line, nice bars on, on the windows, but surveillance systems. Also, uh, making sure that samples are stored in secure facilities and stored properly uh, that are inventoried so you know that somebody's gone in and taken something or used part of a sample. Chain of custody is usually what this is. Make sure there's a good chain of custody going on. So I know David went into the sample vault yesterday. He took an Ebola sample, took it to his lab. He said he, he took you know 10 microliters out to work on a diagnostic kit, but the whole sample's missing. Hey, David, what's going on here? Plus, you were here 12 hours longer than you said you were here. So we need to call the FBI. <laughs> so, part of security measures. Uh, biosafety efforts, making sure appropriate facilities, people have appropriate hoods. As you tour around the lab here, you'll see safety cabinets. Uh, as you're working with uh, bacteria and viruses that can be harmful to people or animals, you should be working in the appropriate safety level. There's a few other factors when it's a live organism extracted materials and you don't have a whole organism. It depends on what safety level you have to work at. But training people to work at the appropriate safety level to wear the appropriate protection so that they don't affect themselves and, and others is, is really critical. Uh, we've, we've gone into places um, in the labs that people are working in a space like this on, like, on tables in the back with open petri plate. Ask them what it is. It's like, oh, we're plating anthrax. Why are you doing it this way? Well, we've always done it this way. None of us have ever gotten sick. What's the problem? <laughs> I said, all right, good. You may have it down pat, but it's not exactly the best safety safety precautions to take. And some don't even have hoods, like I said, at all. Or some have hoods, and when you look at the top, there's no motor and there's an open open flange just onto the ceiling at the top. I guess it protects you from a splash, but if you do an aerosol, it's still going all around the room. So it, it really has no value. So, so teaching folks that, yeah, you have a cabinet, but it's not hooked up, so um, we have a little problem here. And then we, as I mentioned, we work, biosurveillance is really a term for doing detection. It's really looking out there and detecting what's going on in the human or animal population. Um, there's, a, there's a whole list of things that need to go on, all the way from things that happen in the, in the lab, the tests that they get back, but you still need doctors, stuff to help look at this and diagnose and look at the, the symptoms, um, 
to make sure it gets to the lab, and then the reporting, where does it go, how soon, and, and how do we respond to these. So we do a lot of our training around um, this as well. So then I, to round out this part, I just put up some of the things we've done over the years. This is certainly, this is actually a really short list of some of the things we've done. But uh, we've dismantled bioweapons <laughs> facilities in the past. I actually had the dubious honor of going to Kazakhstan, a place called Stepnogorsk, many years ago. Huge facility. Um, this would have been just like the reception area for, for that facility. Um, they had fermenters who grow bacteria that were four stories tall. Four stories tall. They had coal in the floor. These things went up four stories. And probably big around is this area here. And they had six of them. And they were producing anthrax to put on missiles, bombs, to use as a strategic weapon against guess who? And so I asked the laboratory director, how much? And this is huge. And they would pipe this slurry to another building to dry it, because it's liquid, you have to dry it. You want to turn it into a powder, which makes it easier, because if I splash powder in front of you right now, probably before all of you could get out of this room, you, you would get a, a whiff of that powder. So I'm not going to do that. But um, so, so, yeah, so good God, how, how much? How much do you produce here? Well, we never went into full production. But yeah, if, if you did, how much? And I still don't believe this number, but it's an extra 300 kiloton per year. I didn't say 300 ton, I said kiloton. It's kilo me, 1,000. I, I, it, just, it just boggles the mind to think that's, that's what they were doing secretly before the Soviet Union collapsed and we didn't know about it. But once we did, we did go in and dismantle all these places, so none of that technology can be used again in the future. Um, we did, as I said, secure a lot of materials that the, the Soviets had in the time, uh, and a number of research labs uh, destroyed it, consolidated into single labs, so it wasn't just floating around, it was easier to do uh, security. Um, we put in a lot of electronic, uh, disease reporting systems. You see 1,700 sites in, 17, in seven countries to enhance that detection capability. And then um, we helped train technicians and put in, in West Africa, we put in a number of transportable labs uh, to detect new Ebola cases during the West Africa outbreak. Um, one of the issues they had, they did not have laboratory capability to test for Ebola. So why is this really important? We now know after the fact that a number, sad to say, a number of those cases probably could have been prevented because people who most likely did not have a bowl but may have had mild malaria or loss of fever were put in the quarantine ward with the Ebola patients. So what we found out is some folks who were test, tested, um, especially during you know, autopsy, you go back and, and test and confirm, we found uh, co-infections. So we found people in later stages with malaria that were also Ebola infected. So that most likely what happened, they came to the hospital with full-blown malaria, which is diffuse, fever, sweating, uh, deliria. So it looks like really onset of Ebola. And without laboratory testing and diagnostics, it's quite so important. Um, sometimes when a doctor says, I think you have X, Take an aspirin, come back in a couple of days. Sometimes you might want to say, could you run a test? You know, even if I have to pay for it, maybe. I just came back from West Africa, maybe you want to run a test. You know, so it's, it's good to have a little bit of dialogue. You know. and, and truth be told, early on, doctors, and there's some doctors right here, can't discern the difference between a biologic, a, a, a bacterial infection, and a viral infection. So you get antibiotics, it does absolutely nothing for viral infection. But why do you prescribe antibiotics? Because you might, you're pretty sure it's a viral infection, but if it's a bacterial, if you gave the antibiotics earlier, it will have greater impact effect if you wait later. So even though I'm pretty sure it's viral, I'm gonna go ahead and give you antibiotics. And so that's why we over-prescribe antibiotics as a doctor. They're just hedging their bet. It's a lot quicker, 
You don't have to take time to test you and wait for a result to come back. You know, and then give you something immediate that most of us are happy that the doc gave me a pill. And I seem to be getting better in a couple days, which is viral most, most of the time. I got some docs in here who know, so tell, tell the truth. Uh, and, and, so, and so that's why laboratories are really important and diagnostics are so important. We try to teach folks in these areas when we have so many of these high consequence pathogens to really try to rely on testing along with just your digital diagnosis uh, because it's so hard to discern. So we do all this great work around the world. Uh, it is extremely easy, it's fun and rewarding, and we just go in and everything works like that. <laughs> As you can see, there's a, there's a number of challenges uh, that, that we face. One, we're a cooperative program, so hopefully we have a willing and cooperative partner. Sometimes government overseers hire up, say, hey, this is a strategic partner. They have biological material. We know there's violent extremist organizations in the country. They're somewhat of our cooperative partner. Go work with them. Well, you can find out that, yeah, they kind of work with us, but they really don't. So we have a little bit of challenges there from high-level buy-in funding. Um, the other thing is putting things in place that they themselves can afford to own and operate. Uh, it's a huge challenge. We love to give folks the latest and greatest. We always want to, we're the United States, we have to give the Ferrari of, of bio threat reduction because it's just cool. It's just a good thing to do. We have a lot of other foreign donors who do the same thing, but it, it's not the right solution. Um, and so we have to make sure that there's also this notion of us integrating security into public health. That is not a natural thing that happens in a number of these countries. Uh, in a number of these countries, security services are completely separate, and people really don't want to be associated with working with security services in some of these countries because they just have the story of the past. Um, and so it's hard to get the two to mix together, and they really don't see the value of working together because they haven't had a meritrax in their country. They've had a number of these outbreaks, but they haven't in some of these countries seen a meritrax and, and they're used, used to these things. So there's a huge number of uh, challenges. So what do I, this is kind of my list, so what do I see for, for success in these countries going forward and working with these partners? So we need to tailor our solutions for each country and region. You can't come in and say, oh, this is the way we do it, this is the way you should do it. Well, one may not be able to afford to do it this way. And we even see, you know, this, I see in the United States, in all 50 states, you know, each, each state is different. Each state is ruled differently. Each state is sovereign. Each state has its own tax base, has its own different challenges, such so you can't really apply cookie cutter. That's why it's important for the local constituent to get involved and know what's going on in the local government to do a lot of So we think at this level, uh, we, we really have to have that mentality. And we can't be just providing stuff and being prescriptive. Here's this to do this way. We really have to look at what's needed and how it's done. And there's a lot of cultural differences that may not allow them to do things the way we do. Or, like I said, they don't have the base yet uh, to do some of these things. We need to invest over the long term. Uh, we like quick wins and quick gains. Uh, a lot of the issue we face is not the technology piece itself. It's really the workforce development and building a generation of folks who get used to, to doing these things and learning and using new techniques and such. Critical thinking skills. Uh, I just had this conversation earlier. In some cultures, you actually get punished for being proactive and thinking outside the box. There's a way to do it in their culture. We, you know, we're taught to criticize everything, you know, question everyone, be proactive. We're, we're you know, American culture, we're a little more in your face about things and looking for new ways to do things. We're always saying, hey, everybody, if you can identify a better way to do it, speak up, let's do it. Uh, it doesn't work that way in, in other places. Um, we need to get, get folks helping each other out there instead of us always helping, helping them, teaching them to, to teach each other um, is, is the long-term long solution. Um, and we need to support some of their local priorities um, and issues. I'm coming in and telling them I'm worried about anthrax attack, you know, in the world. And here they have multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. 
which is their biggest issue. They have an active cholera outbreak. So how do we take with some of their critical issues and use that to teach security safety measures that can also be used for bio threat reduction and for bioterrorism um, type of solutions. And we need to, to build relationships and trust. Um, a lot of what's been done in the past is a lot of researchers and, and governments have been um, complicit in this, going into some of these regions saying, oh, you can't handle this, we'll just take the samples out and we'll do all this for you and then we keep the data and not share it back uh, and use it to build diagnostics and therapeutics and not giving any credit or teaching these partners on how to be involved in that process and do it themselves. Now we gotta get away from that and prevent things like that from happening and build them into the community that they can start doing these and innovating for themselves or being part of the innovation uh, going forward. You're gonna build trust in what happens with that. Uh, there's gonna be a willingness to, to share data with you a lot sooner and earlier during the outbreak so that we can all come together as a community and do something about it. But once again, whether it's uh, a terrorist attack accidental or beginning of a potential pandemic. So taking some of those principles in mind, we come up with our own concept. It's a little simple, of building threat reduction networks. So I want to see the bad guys, if you read and see what's going on, those who plan 9-11, plan attacks, they have a little network going, they have a social media network, they do some nefarious things. To, to communicate best practices with each other and provide expertise to each other to do nefarious things. Um, um, it's kind of quite interesting once you start seeing this and reading some articles and researching it. So we need to think about building networks for the security purposes, but also integrated into public health and going back to teaching these countries locally and regionally how to work together. Uh, there's some areas culturally and because of past historical differences, uh, just got used to this culture of, does, you watch your disease outbreak maps, they stop at the border. You're like, well, what happens when it gets to the border? Like, we don't know, we don't care. Is it coming from the other side or is it going to the other side? We don't know, we don't care, we're just worried about our side. So those are the type of things if you're gonna help prevent future pandemics or know whether there was a terrorist attack on the right side of the border, left side of the border, you really need to be talking to each other. So we need to break down those stove pipes. We need to build a network so that, in some cases, uh, our partners, they don't have to rely on us in the US. I'm all the way over here in Washington, D.C. If they have an outbreak and an issue in Cambodia, I'm on the other side of the world. And if they need to talk to us, we'll probably dead asleep and have my iPhone in do not disturb mode. Um, so they need to have local experts and partners that they can network with and quickly um, work on solutions and, and problems. So we've had a couple of different types of threat reduction networks. Uh, one is biosecurity based networks to work on those biosecurity issues, looking for new innovations and ways to do biosecurity. Uh, is there ways to sample, archive, you know, store samples, uh, maybe it's, it's to work on, maybe you do whole genome sequencing, depending on what you're doing, and just archive the majority of that data and then only keep a very few number of samples or ways you can inactivate the material um, so that you can still figure out what some of the characteristics are without destroying it, but then rendering it safe. So there, there are some ways of, of doing this and looking at innovation security. Research-based networks, looking at what some common research areas are that need to work together, I'll give an example or two. Uh, on some common research projects and areas and trying to get various scientists together from the US, from other countries that may have great expertise with some of these countries and working together on a problem set because as much money as we wish there was in research and innovation, there's really a limited pool of dollars uh, that's that's out there. Uh, it you know, NIH has a huge budget, but when you see it split up among all the things they do, it's really small. Same thing in this community. So we really need to leverage um, each other's research dollars and get people working on different parts of the problem and then coming together for a, a single solution. 
and then disease surveillance-based networks. Uh, like I said, in some of these places, they have these uh, key diseases, uh, biological agents circulating and causing outbreaks on a reoccurring basis. Uh, and people don't understand kind of how some of these organisms circulate in the environment. When do you expect it? Some, some diseases just happen on a cycle during certain seasons, like dry season, wet season. And when it's not dry or wet season, sometimes we don't know where these organisms kind of hide until they present themselves and start infecting people. Understanding that may lead you to better preventive measures. And it's hard because you need a lot of different expertise to come together and figure that out. You need to bring folks together and try to solve these problems together. Um, so really all this slide, I'm not gonna spend much time, is just saying what we're also focused on, we just don't wanna do research and bring folks together just for collecting information and just doing general discovery. I want them to think about what the problem is and then turning that, identifying, develop a plan forward, do the work, evaluate it. And we really want to get in the, hand, in the hands of the decision makers to inform policy or make a public health statement decision. You know, for public health, if there's a water problem, it says boil water before you ingest it. You know, it's not safe to even take a shower. Want those kind of things to come out of the, these networks and get people to think about this and work together to develop these. So, a couple examples. Um, well, I'll just talk to you for a little bit. And I think we're good on time. I'm getting near the end here. So. Um, Biosurveillance Network and the Silk Road. Actually, our partners came up with this name. I wish I could take credit. It's a really cool, cool name. Uh, this started out with the Republic of Georgia, not the state of Georgia, but the Republic of Georgia, which maybe Georgia is a republic, you know, that's a bit, uh, uh, and their border uh, partner, Azerbaijan, um, that's in the Caucasus region, you know where that's at. It's, if you go to, people know where Iran is, if you go to Iran and go north of Iran, you'll start running into these countries on your way to Europe. So, in case you don't know geography, I, I've learned a lot of geography being in this, this program, as you can tell from the map I showed previously. But, uh, so, so these, these countries had uh, a problem across the border. There's this disease called brucellosis. Usually people get it from drinking milk. Usually cattle, usually get from milk or eating contaminated um, meats. Doesn't have a high death rate, but if untreated, it certainly is fatal to humans. Uh, it's really devastating to your cattle. It causes um, early abortion, so you can't you know, have cattle uh, propagate. It reduces milk production, and if you're living on a farm, reduce, you, depending on this, it, uh, it uh, limits your food supply, your milk supply, and plus make everybody in your household sick. But it's a huge problem in most of the world because they don't do stringent pasteurization processes that we do and really monitor for, for this. We've, we've eliminated because of the pasteurization we do for milk, so we don't worry about brucellosis in this country. That will eliminate it. But if you're a household that milks your own cow, you don't pasteurize, so this is where you see this in a lot of part of the world. But so they had this problem across the border and people traded these animals across the border, contaminated milk and stuff, but as I said, the data on the left side stayed on the left side, the data on the right side stayed on the right side. So the, if one side was gonna do something to prevent the outbreak and spread, but didn't tell the other side, and the other side didn't do anything, you're gonna keep getting it coming over. So they said, we really need to get together and talk about regional detection and surveillance. So the reason it became Network of the Silk Road is because then they said, Hey, our partners in Uzbekistan, why don't you join us? You have similar problems. Folks in Kazakhstan, come and join us. Let's talk about this. Folks in Ukraine, come and talk to us. Folks in Turkey, come be part of the network because we need to talk about disease spreading among all our countries and how we can better share data. And if you know a little bit of history of the Silk Road, it kind of winds its way through this. So we came up with this. But it's led them to coming up with their own research projects. What's been the beauty of this is we used to fund about all their research in this area, all 
they're reporting together, and they come up with their own projects. They're working on their own agreements with each other on sharing data through this network. And they're growing it by saying, hey, we've got other partners we want to pull in, and you should be part of this, and they're convincing them to be part of this. And they're actually doing more threat reduction work together than I would have ever imagined we could have done with each of these individual countries by partnering up and, and working on common problems together. Um, another one we have is one of those research networks, it is the BAT One Health Research Network called BORN. Um, so th these are folks spread out once again from the Georgia, Azerbaijan area, Turkey, all the way over to Southeast Asia researchers. So it turns out bats are really fascinating. Um, I don't know how many people know anything about bats in the audience. Has anybody ever looked at study bats? So one thing I was fascinated about, you know, I think most of us think of bats are just here locally, right? They're in their local attic and stuff, and they just hang out here locally for perpetuity, which means forever. Uh, no, it's not the case. A lot of species of bats actually travel and migrate like birds. It's really interesting across vast regions, especially in Asia and, and Africa. The other thing interesting about bats is they have a fascinating immune system. A lot of people starting to study their immune system. They can carry a lot of these disease agents and they don't appear or seem to get sick at all. And so they become very good carriers uh, for these pathogens. So there's a lot we don't understand. The folks have been doing um, genetic, looking for DNA of, of various pathogens uh, and seeing if they're there and they found some that are interesting. But then there hasn't been enough work to see if they've been reacting to these exposed. So it's really spent a lot of time investing in the, uh, the blood and the antibodies they produce from being exposed and really researching um, in depth their immune system. And none of the folks are getting funding and starting to do this. So we're bringing the group together to look at this and see, you know, bats carry zoonotic diseases, as I mentioned earlier, and can present those to people. How do they do it? What can you do to prevent? The other thing, bats have a lot of economic value in the world too. So the other thing we're trying to do through this network is also work with ecologists in this network. How can we sample bats? Um, the big thing is without killing, some of these bats are really small and they get a blood sample. You know, if you don't handle them correctly, you can kill the bat. And it's the last thing we want to do, because some areas, they're major pollinators, they control insects, they can control mosquitoes, which actually probably keeps the disease burden down lower than the bats carrying disease. So they're really fascinating, but they could be a sentinel animal for knowing what's circulating and how it may be circulating. But we also need to do, these folks are working on an educational campaign to work on the conservation and the of, of these bats as well, so that local populations, we've had this happen in Africa, not our group, but other groups. Once I told the locals that bats were carrying marble cars or Ebola, the locals went in and killed all the bats in the field. Last thing you want to happen. And then another species, later on, another species came in and took over the cave, so they weren't rid of bats, but they killed a whole species of bats in the cave, which is the last thing we want. So, uh, so then the Western Asia Bat Network, uh, they're looking at specific areas in the Middle East. This group worked with Georgians and Jordanians. Uh, they like to call their network Bats for Peace uh, because they're mainly Jordanians, Iraqis, uh, Syrians, Lebanese. And what's happened in the Middle East because of a lot of conflict and strife, scientists who are really contrary to popular perception and the Big Bang Theory, are very social creatures. I'm here to tell you, they are very social creatures and they, they really need that social interaction. And they network and love to go to conferences, talk to other scientists about what's going on. But what's happened in, in that area over a number of years because of conflict and restrictions and stuff, scientists haven't had this opportunity to do it locally. They've always had to go outside the area to do a lot of this. So they, they got together and developed this work on some specific bat sampling and speciation in their area, but, but they came up with the term bats for peace uh, to bring together uh, the scientists in, in the region, which is pretty good. 
And then the other two are disease-based research networks there. Um, it's, as I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of local folks in Thailand, Cambodia, Laos working on malleolosis. So this is a soil-borne disease. It's really hard to diagnose. It looks, it looks like fever, uh, you know, early symptoms of cold, flu, and then symptoms kind of come and go. Um, and some people have been diagnosed with maybe being a cancer patient. It's really nebulous symptoms. The only way you can really tell somebody has melanosis is what you get from the soil and um, this bact bacteria called Pseudium mallei. Um, so you know, scientists like to use a lot of Latin terms. But uh, happens this part of the world, but people get undiagnosed. Uh, they don't get diagnosed at all because clinicians say, oh, it might be malaria, it might be this, go, go and do this. And by the time they come back, they're so critical that a lot of these people just die, a lot of the children, young folks, folks working out and getting exposed to the soil. And they don't send samples to the laboratory and they don't really think that this is a problem in their area. So we're trying to educate them that if they have these nebulous symptoms, you really need to send a lab sample to rule out maleodosis. Um, Thailand is working with these countries. Thailand has convinced their farmers working in the rice fields, these are people who usually get it because they go barefoot in the rice fields, to wear a certain type of rubber boot. They tested out which rubber boots work with them and they educated them. This protects them and their family from maleodosis. So, uh, and uh, I'll, just, I'll just move on from there. We have another one, Rickettsia is working with folks on detection and pooling of Rickettsia in the world too. So, so, so we, we propose that instead of just giving partners um, stuff and telling them how to do things, we really want to teach them how to work together in kind of a community network setting. And it's not really new, but for threat reduction and working on some of these problems, like I said, most of the donors in the world have just provided stuff and, and said, this is how you do it. As you can see, we want to focus a lot of things on issues, concerns that they have in their region that will help strengthen their public health, the health of their animals, but they work together as a community. Not everyone knows everything. We all sitting in this room, we could probably form an awesome network because of all the various different experiences we have and backgrounds on solving a problem. If we sat here and brainstormed, what's our problem of the day? Then we could as an individual or one or two people. And what we what we need to happen is for the security safety mindset and problem solving for early detection stuff um, to become a routine thing that becomes sustained in those countries and those regions. Because we as the United States and as taxpayers don't want to pay for somebody else doing public health detection reporting for as long as they exist. We want to teach them how to do it and graduate them and see them grow up and do it on their own and also become a good partner that can contribute back to our safety and security, national security, and so form this, this partnership. So for some of the impact, um, as you can see up here, to start standardizing best practices, teaching each other best practices. Our best practice here in the United States may not be a best practice over in the region, so having people in the regions discuss culturally their own best practices and working together is the way to go. Um, determining disease burden and other uh, national impacts of so disease burden just means realizing how big of a problem it is in the country and how much it's circulating. And really um, having the, the local and national folks to get these uh, communities of practice engagement content and share uh, information with all the stakeholders and, as I said, make this connection with decision makers and take information to give in the hands that make sense of decision makers that can use. You notice I didn't have, to, hopefully, not too much technical jargon in here, no calculus equations, uh, you know, not too many technical terms and a lot of technical uh, descriptions or Latin descriptions of organisms. Whenever you go to decision makers, um, well, especially in Washington, CDC, much about me, when you talk to them, you start saying some of these things, their eyes glaze over. Um, and they're, there you guys go on, you scientists. One thing, you, you, you tell me words I don't understand, and then when I ask a question, I get a lot of, it depends. So, you know, 
We as scientists love that, right? It depends, because we only know the data we know, but when somebody asks a question, it depends. Uh, and so we have to learn also to work together in the community best practice of what works best for messaging back to decision makers that they can understand and, and implement an action. Because they really do want to implement an action, but if they don't understand what we're telling them, it, it's hard for them to implement that action. And uh, mo most do. And then, um, so, and for, for planning and going forward, um, it really it really helps us understand better and inform um, the target areas that we need to budget and where um, we need to put our dollars in short by helping identify the problem areas uh, more concretely. And then it also helps you get people excited and you help support the network and get people involved and networking together. Uh, and you start meeting folks, and I love to use use here as a as an example in, in the innovation center. You start meeting people in other disciplines. You start having some interesting conversations. You get people excited and thinking about new ways of doing things and bringing different people together uh, that may not have come together originally. And and then you also you start building champions. You want people to get excited and do this stuff on their own instead of telling this is what you really should be doing. Nobody wants mom and dad always telling you this is what you should be doing. You want to yourself get excited about something, you become a, a champion about it. So, and then this is this last slide that I'm here to show is one of my favorites. Um, it's it's this is a really busy. It's not a technical science slide, but get get past all the boxes and stuff. Just look at the red circle. So you never know what impact you're going to have um, if you run. A meeting, a workshop, and come together and really focus on a problem and trying to problem solve. Um, this is the thing you want to see as a result of that. You just don't want to have a meeting and everybody go away and go do their own thing. You want it to be a spark and catalyst for other things going on. So some of these networks I mentioned earlier were catalyzed by this meeting, as you can see in Singapore in 2014. We had a group of folks who said, we all have bats in our countries. We see all these reports of, of bats being associated with Ebola, maybe MERS, Kobe, some of the big things we've heard about, but we don't, we don't know how to do sampling and capture and have the resources to do the studies. Could you convene a workshop together and help us? And we brought together folks who we knew that did this, folks we didn't even Hey, and other research projects we found them doing things, brought them together to work on this. And a lot of these boxes represent other groups that were started. They said, hey, we need to continue working on this. And then some of these other boxes represent where they said, we really need to work on a research project together. Let's propose together and get funding together to work on this together. And this has actually spawned three or four of those other networks that I, that I said. So leave you with this. You know, networks, we're used to having social networks, we don't think much of them, but they can really, you know, it's always just talked about, they can just be a network where you just hang out and you just casually share information, or you can take it to something meaningful and look for it to drive to a result and drive to action, and when you do, it can be a catalyst for something else. So putting a little effort, time, and a little passion into it. You never know where this leads, and it's going to lead to folks developing a network, Bats for Peace, who would have ever thought, and getting a group of scientists in the world that have been blacked out in their own regional group of working together and solving a problem. And in the end of the day, I mean, it's, it's great because we spend less dollars and times of doing threat reduction while others are doing it themselves and naturally working on some of these problems together. So. Uh, is all I had for this evening, and thank you for sticking around and listening to me ramble on for the last hour. So appreciate it. Thank you.